and on the other hand, sentencing them. So what, what, the word that's actually used there in the Greek means, do not sentence someone to hell, lest, now you get it? It doesn't mean don't judge people as in discern, because the Bible tells us we are to judge people by their fruit. I can judge Muhammad by his fruit. What is his fruit? Violence. Spoil. <laughs> you know, um, he's a teenage boy who got far too much power. He's violent. He's hypersexual. He lies and thinks it's okay to lie if you're doing it for Allah. So you can break all of the commandments of God. And they claim to uphold the Ten Commandments. You can break all of those commandments as long as you are convinced in your own mind that you're doing it for the betterment and the glory of Allah, the further the kingdom of Allah. In the name of Allah. And that includes roasting babies in front of the parents. Uh-huh. As long as you're doing it for the sake of Allah. See, Allah can't do it himself, so he needs you to do it for him. Now you see what the problem is? You shall know them by their... You see, I don't have to fly an airplane into the World Trade Center because the God I serve, he could run an earthquake fault with his finger right underneath the, the two towers. They would collapse, and the geologist would be saying the next day in the news, we've just discovered a brand new fault that runs right through New York City. That's the God I serve. He doesn't need my help. He allows me to participate in the work that he's doing. It's like the kid, his dad builds the entire fence around the property, and his dad lets him pound in the last nail. And what does he go to the house and tell mom? I built the fence. So understand that we cannot judge. And what that little paragraph says, it gives a couple of examples that I think will help you to understand where things are going. He said, one of the first ones was, uh, he said, uh, he, an example of a conductor, an, an experienced train conductor, who was on the train from Basel, Switzerland, to, uh, to Munchen, Germany. And he, of course, knew the route. And when he started looking out the window, he realized that um, the train was going in the wrong direction because none, none of the scenery made any sense to him. And he started telling the passengers on board the train, you've got you to get off, stop, pull the cord, get off, you've got to get off. The train, is, the, 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 I, I know, we're on the wrong train. And the passengers were confused. After questioning him, the passengers figured out he was on the wrong train. They were on the right train. So do not make judgments because you're not in a position to do so. You know, um, I put down, uh, you know, we tend to think that we are right. We tend to think that we're the smartest people on the block. Not really, not really, you know. But I, I, I suggest you read it because there's some very, very good things in there that I think would be helpful. Um, the, the second example I thought would be worth your while reading is the one where he said uh, it's about a preacher who was working on his sermon. He's on a train. It's a Saturday. He's working on his sermon for tomorrow. And there is a little girl who's seated right across from him who is just throwing temper tantrums. She's about two years old, and she's in that period that we call the terrible twos. Yeah. Why is Sue smiling? <laughs> <laughs> and um, the uh, the preacher is just about having because he can't concentrate on writing a sermon so he speaks to the lady sitting next to the girl and he says lady why don't you control this girl any better you're her mother do something about it and the lady looks at him and she says I'm not her mother <laughs> and he said well where's her mother and she, he's, the lady says, she's in the next car behind us. And he said, why is she in the next car? She ought to be here. And the lady says, 
She's in the baggage compartment in a casket. Oh. Don't judge. If you were two years old and you lost your mom, you'd be doing the same thing. So let's go to page 58. And we'll begin. Uh, I just finished in chapter 14 explaining to you that the main thing is Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if I'm a vegetarian or if I'm a meat eater. It doesn't matter whether I wear a three-piece suit, whether I, I cut my hair or I grow my hair long. Those are all side issues that are totally irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. We are absolute masters of majoring on the minors and minoring on the majors. No, the major thing and the only thing and the main thing is Jesus Christ. The main thing is the main person. Um, it's very, very important that you understand this because as we leave chapter 14 and we're now entering chapter 15, the fundamental issue that, that this, this surprised me too, is dealing with the question of the weak brother versus the stronger brother. And I thought that the weak brother was the guy who didn't have all the rules and regulations and, and special instructions and all that. I thought the strong one was the guy that had a million rules. You know, like the Pharisees that had, I think, what, 680 something different. Uh, uh, commandments that they created out of the Ten Commandments, I thought that was the stronger guy. But what this is showing is that he's actually the weaker guy because he needs all those rules to keep him in line. The weaker guy is the guy who trusts in the Holy Spirit to guide him, and so he has little or no rules. It doesn't matter to him if you want to eat a filet mignon. It doesn't matter. And understanding that critical fact, which will make sense as we go into the into the chapter, verse one. We then that are strong, now remember the person that's strong is the person who has less rules, and you know, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the Pharisees, of the weak, that's what it says, and to not please ourselves. In other words, if we know that somebody's got a million rules, so they, they insist on having this happen on Saturday, they insist on not eating meat and all of that, we are to bear their, their weaknesses. Now, we'll, well, I'll show you in, in, in a little while that the guy that is highly disciplined, the one who looks like he just took a bath in lemon juice, you know, his face is sour and twisted. That guy needs all of these rules just to keep himself straight. And the, the Pharisees were famous for this. Look at verse 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. What that means is that we are going to please our neighbor for our neighbor's good to edify the neighbor. Not to edify ourselves but to edify or build up uh, our neighbor. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them, that would be us, that reproached thee fell on me. All of us have sinned. Now, you, run, you come into a, to a situation where you say, Jesus upset the Pharisees a great deal because he healed people on the Sabbath day. And to them, wait a minute, that's a violation of, 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 of the rule. But you'll notice something. Of all Ten Commandments, the only one that was not repeated by Christ in the Christian Testament was keep the Sabbath holy. I find that interesting. In other words, he's saying the Sabbath was uh, it was meant for a good purpose, but we have put so many rules and attachments to it that it has become ridiculous. <coughs> he said, that, as you recall, the Pharisees, of course, re uh, 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 reproached them 
continually about doing healing people on the Sabbath, about doing things on the Sabbath. Uh, and then there were other times when Christ laid aside his liberty. And he didn't reproach the weak. He, he laid aside his liberty. He says, I'm going to do this. If it bothers you, we're going to do it this way. <coughs> And you see an example of this when Peter came in Matthew 17, uh, verses 24 to 27. <coughs> Peter came to uh, uh, to uh, uh, Jesus. He had just been asked by the Pharisees, uh, does your master pay taxes at the temple? There was a temple tax. And uh, Peter, realizing that it was kind of a difficult question, he just said, yeah, yeah, of course we do. And then he goes and he asks Jesus, do we pay temple tax? <laughs> Does he, 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 he was sure. Um, and uh, Jesus said, as, instead of, you know, I, I, I love this because this, this is a classical Jewish mother's question. You know, she, you ask her a question and she answers it by asking you a question, right? And so she, Jesus says, do kings charge their own kids with taxes? Well, they don't. Kings don't charge their the kids to pay taxes. So Jesus says, but in order that we don't offend the Pharisees. In other words, he's saying, this is a point where I don't offend. You know, when the, when the Pharisees come to me and says, why did you heal this guy? I reproached them. He corrected them. Uh, but the verse that we just read, verse 2, in, in, uh, verses 2 and 3 in, um, in chapter uh, 15, it's basically saying, try and get along with your, your weaker brother, you know? If he thinks that you shouldn't eat me, you know, humor him, whatever. You say, well, which one do I do? Do I correct them, or do I go along with them? And the answer is, you let the Holy Spirit be your guide. Never mind Disney and let your conscience be your guide. Your conscience is corrected like mine. No. Let it the Holy Spirit be your guide. Remember, Jesus said, when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come, and he will come to reside in you. And if you allow him, eventually he will come happy to rule over you. That is what you would like to have happen in your life. Because he will guide you. He will, he will at the right time, he will give you the right answer. Um, he will help you to bear up those who are weak, and he will tell you at other times when you need a sword of correction, i.e., what is the sword of correction? The Bible. The Word of God is a sword, it's a two-edged sword. So, he, what Jesus is saying to you is that you're going to have to walk moment by moment and be dependent on God, the Holy Spirit. Now, we tend not to like that. You know, we want a Soviet-era five-year plan. Yeah. As, you know, the Communist Party of China, a 10-year plan, right? God is saying, no. You take the next step, and I'll tell you what happens after that. And you're saying, well, God, where's the five-year plan? No. Take the first step, and then I'll tell you what happens in the second step. Trust me. That's what he's saying. Uh, so, understand that the whole concept here is that you say, well, how do I know? We depend on God. Now in verse 4, he said, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, meaning before, were written for our learning. Uh, and he gives several examples here. The, the first example was uh, Genesis 13, uh, verses 8 to 9, where Abraham is speaking to Lot. And there's a, a subtlety in here that would be lost in our modern generation. But this is the point where um, Lot and Abraham's um, uh, herdsmen were fighting with each other over um, grazing territory. And one of the things that we have lost in our modern society is that in, in ancient societies, deference was paid to the older, the elder. Deference is an old uh, 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 English word that means we defer to, like, you know, in our in Western 
Christian civilization, we say we pay women deference, meaning we defer to them. So when you go into a restaurant with your wife, who picks the seat? Right? Okay? We defer to, to, to our wives. We defer to women. Uh, you know. Um, well, a real gentleman does. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, in ancient societies, deference was paid to the elders of society. So in ancient societies, if a situation came up where an older gentleman and a younger gentleman have to decide on who gets what or, or you know, the younger gentleman is expected to give the older gentleman first choice. That was expected. That's the way the society functioned. Of course, in our society, that was lost. And if you and if you think it was lost recently, go back to the the list of survivors of the Titanic. The the list of survivors is like overwhelmingly female names. Overwhelmingly female names. And when you saw a male name. It was a little boy. There are only a couple of grown men who are on there. Astor, you know, these rich people, they, they, you know, uh, the Astors, in case you don't know who they were, they were extremely wealthy. They were filthy rich. Uh, 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 at New Yorkers, and then there was another, I forgot, another wealthy New, New Yorker was there. But, Is that the, where the hotel name comes from? Yes, they, those are the those are the same people. Yes, uh -huh. um, they. Uh, th this is something that would be normal. In fact, if you go back in George Washington's writings, he wrote that if an older man and a younger man were having a dispute, the younger should defer to the older. Because that's the way society functioned. Of course, today, <laughs> they would probably run over a little old lady with their motorcycle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, not. Yeah, about a week and a half ago, his yes. grandfather was pushing his young child, grandchild. Yes, I saw that video. And the guy that is disgusting. Sucker punched him. Right. He did what? Sucker punched him, like you know, oh, yeah, yeah. He, he punched him, and the guy wasn't expecting, like he didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, so when Abraham said to Lot, uh, you know, we have a strife between us, Lot's position would have been to say, Abraham, you're the senior one here, you choose. That's not what happened. And you think this started in the 1960s? No. <laughs> what did Lot do? Lot says, just give me the green land over there. You take whatever is left over. Abraham deferred to him because Lot was weaker. Are you getting it? The God spoke. Most likely God, the Holy Spirit, spoke to Abraham and said, let him have that. You know, uh, the, the third example is Jonathan. Jonathan and David. Jonathan understood that God had chosen David to be the next king. That he, Jonathan, the son of Saul, would not be that king. And he accepted it. It is the Lord's will. In other words, if the Lord doesn't want me to do something, and I go out and against all odds, manage to make it happen, it's not going to be a happy situation. It's not. Uh, the David and in, uh, in uh, another such situation occurs with David in uh, 1 Samuel 24 where David had an opportunity to kill Saul in a cave and he chose not to because he said if God wants Saul dead he doesn't need my help what did I tell you at the beginning of this if my God wanted to destroy the Twin Towers, he's not going to say, Gordon, I could use you. No, no, not going to happen that way. No. Okay? Um, 
And the last one was uh, when uh, Moses chose. He chose not to live in the comfort as the son of Pharaoh. And which he easily would have become the next Pharaoh. He chose to forego that because God spoke. He knew that that was not the right choice. That was not the right choice at all. Uh, and the rest of verse 4. For we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. In other words, I'm not worried about, you say, well, good grief, uh, you know, this is going to, you know, uh, Trump might lose the next election. So what? God is not depending on Trump. You say, well, Biden might win the next election. <coughs> Who cares? You notice I, I am never worried about the elections? No. You say, well, people might cheat. Let them cheat. They're supposed to cheat. And if God lets them get away with it, it's God, it means God is allowing them to get away with it. And as I said to you, God, when God allows you to do something, that is, is his permissible will, not his perfect will, but his permissible will. He's allowing you to do it. Verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to Christ Jesus. God is patient. That's what he's telling us here. God is patient. And I ask you the question in there. If you were God, how long would you put up with you? Not very long. I can tell you from my perspective, I would be called the queen of tarts. Off with their heads. She was a wonderful lady, actually. She was in my high school class. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, verses uh, verses uh, 6 and 7. But you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. We have to stay with one mind, one heart. How do we do that? By staying in his word. When you start saying, you know, I don't need fellowship with the body by going to church. Sundays. You begin a drift that is imperceptible in the beginning. Yeah. And it's like if you were uh, uh, directing a spacecraft from here to Mars and you're off by point, uh, with, with a 93 million mile journey, and you're off by point zero 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 one degree, you're in big trouble. Because you're multiplying by 93 million. <coughs> So it's imperceptible at first, but eventually it, it will catch up with you. You start saying, well, you know, and you, say, you know, I, I don't need to study the Bible. I don't need to study the Bible either at home or, uh, or in Gordon's Bible study. You say, well, of course, Gordon, you will say that, of course. <laughs> yeah, but don't no, hear me out. If you are not in the Bible, forget Gordon for a minute. I urge each and every one of you, Pick up your Bible, and I don't care whether you spend five minutes or you spend five hours. Spend a few minutes in the Word every single day. You know what? Drag your spouse into it if you have to. It is good to hear the voice of God. And you'd be amazed how it can relate to what you're going through at any given point in time. Uh, now, it you, says, you, you, just sure. can't, you can't read the Bible like a novel. No. You have to read, you have to grasp every word. Uh huh. I, uh, I agree with reading the Bible out loud. Now, when I say out loud, I don't mean you get a megaphone and put it in the. Uh, uh, <laughs> South Coast Plaza. It That's not. Focus. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Uh, for me, it helps, it does help me to be more concentrated if I'm reading it out loud. And I'm reading it really to myself, really. Uh, and I think a little bit 
every day. It, you say, well, it takes me three, four years to go through the Bible. That's wonderful. Just go through it. And when you get to the end, go back to the beginning. And start all over again. And I assure you, you are going to run into passages that you say, that wasn't there the last time I read through it. Or you will see a meaning to something that you knew was there before, but you never saw that particular meaning. And, and, that, and that's why I urge you to have a private Bible study. Yeah. Just a little cute thing. In John Wimber's testimony, John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard. Yes, uh huh. He, uh, when they they started he started reading the Bible uh, before he went to church for the first time. Wow. And uh, he and his wife were reading it. And then when they went to church, they they thought everybody was disabled as they were reading the, the Bible, like they had a list because it with the, it was the King James version. Right. So that with all the right. will it and do it. So You're it's right. just yeah. a cute little yes. thing uh, about reading it out loud. That, that's funny, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's kinda cute. But uh Ooh. this is on uh, uh, uh Verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. I understand Jesus came to the Jews as a Jew in order to share truth with the Jews. You know, uh, I always like to point out to people, you know, people, you know, uh, trust me, uh, my own, uh, my own cousins uh, uh, from New York, uh, who were the, actually the first uh, American branch of my family that I ever had an opportunity to meet, uh, they don't communicate very much with me because they think I'm a racist and I don't like blacks. Gee, Sounds kind of weird, to me, but, uh, but because I don't subscribe to their views, uh, you know, their political views, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I like to point out to people, you know, people say, to me, oh, you know, I I belong to you know this particular ethnic group, or I'm a young black female, this many trisexual, or whatever you are. I understand something. Before Christ came, incarnated, not. Visit. Christ made many visitations to the earth before he came in the body of a human being, before his incarnation. There are only two ethnic groups in the world. There always have been and will be just two ethnic groups until the end of the millennium. Before Christ came in the incarnation, the two ethnic groups were Jews and Gentiles. That's it. You say, well, wait a minute, what about the French, the Germans? And no, I said there were two ethnic groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. After he came for the first visit, as he came in human form, the incarnation, there were still two ethnic groups, except they were called the saved and the unsaved. I like how Dave Newman puts it. Either you're a saint, That is, and you say, well, you know, does that apply to Jews? No, it applies to everybody. Either you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, or you haven't, and you're taking your chances. So, understand that there are only two ethnic groups. You say, well, what about the Japanese? And the, you can't have nonsense. It's not going to count for anything. Not in front of Christ. It's not going to count. It's not going to mean anything. We are all saints. And either you're a saint and you've submitted your life to Christ, or you're not. It's really that simple. Verse 9 that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. <coughs> the Gentiles desperately needed mercy. Desperately. As it is written, for this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles 
and sing unto thy name. This is a quotation from Psalm 18, verse 49. He is in the midst of our praise. The Bible tells us when we praise God, he is in the midst of our praise. Verse 10. And again, he said, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people, the Jews. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and laud him, meaning honor him. That's an old English word that means honor. All you people. That is a direct quotation from Deuteronomy. Chapter 32, verse 43. And the next one, you should you should have already know where the, the next part of this verse comes from. And it says, and again, Isaiah said, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall reign. Uh, and, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. In other words, Isaiah is saying the coming Messiah is not going to rule just over the Jews. He's going to rule over the whole earth. And Isaiah, of course, this is, a, this is a famous quotation from Isaiah uh, chapter 11, verse 10. Um, and so root shall come out of Jesse, and the branch shall spring from his, from his roots. The Spirit of God will be upon him. The Spirit, wisdom, and truth. Jesus quoted that verse when he began his ministry. Um, The whole issue here that I'm trying to get to you is that, you know, someone like me who God has blessed with an, an ability to read and, and, and accept his word as true, because there was a time in my life when I didn't think so. But he, he has been merciful to me. He has given me that, that, that ability. I should not look down don't see it. That's what this verse is saying. I need to be patient with those that don't see it. I don't, uh, you know, and that's why you notice I focus on the word and on the Bible. I, you've heard me say, I don't like communism. Not for political reasons. I don't care about politics. I don't like communism because it is godless. In communism, the state is God. The state provides everything. There's no room for a God. That's why communism likes the Big Bang Theory and evolution. So my reasons are not political, they are biblical, they are godless. Thou shalt have no other gods, including the state, before me. And so, I, it comes back to the word, I need to be patient. So I ran into a seven young kid who, um, you know, Mark studied my, my own brother, a professor. Uh, you know, he was far left liberal. I mean, I love him because he's my brother, but I don't share his political views, and I had to be patient with him. I don't say, well, that's it, I'm cutting off communication with you because you're a left-wing communist. No. We have to bear one another's words and weaknesses. This is where I'm dependent on the Holy Spirit to tell me, um, punch him in the nose, no, <laughs> bear with him or correct him. And now you get it? And do not ever let me tell you this, do not ever think that just because you know something and the Pentecostals don't know it, that you're better than them. No. God is in control and he has people in every single denomination. In fact, when we come for revolution, uh, revelation, <laughs> uh, yeah, when we come for revelation, uh, uh, well, it is a revolution when you think about it. Uh, uh, the, I believe it's the fourth letter. It's a letter to the Catholic Church. I'll, I'll, I'll point it out to you in greater detail why I say that. 
and in it, Christ still says, but there are some among you that have not bent the knee to Jezebel. In other words, what Christ is saying is, the Catholic Church, there are still people in it who are faithful to me. The charismatic Catholic movement is exactly that. People who say, forget all this Saint, Saint nonsense, Saint Mary, Saint Anthony, and all that. It's just one thing called the main thing, which is Jesus Christ. Now you're getting it? So don't feel you're better than somebody else because you understand something. Fear one another's burdens. Oh, how rude it is. Okay, all right, we're going to stop at the end of verse, uh, uh, verse 12. Uh, Bear one another's burdens. Uh, Bear one another's burdens means if the guy is, is saying, well, you know, I'm a vegetarian because I believe vegetarians are closer to God, and you go out with you know that person, you know, it, it, just just eat whatever is put in front of you. I thought bear one another's was that was that right there in Romans. Um, that that is, uh, let me see what we're going to do. I think it's it, it's in an earlier chapter. <clears throat> I'm pretty certain it is. Let me go back. Um, I'm sorry. It is in an earlier chapter. I would have to go back and, and look at it. But the answer to your question is, is it in Romans? Yes. It's not up to you to change another person. It's up to God. Correct. Correct. It, because, you know, you look it's at it. It's your job. The, we could look at the Pharisees and say, they're just uptight. They, they took a bath and lemon juice. And the Pharisees could look at us and say, you guys, I wouldn't even have allowed you guys to touch the hem of my garment. The one asking us Galatians. It, it's Galatians. The one I, the one I stepped bottom was in Galatians. Oh, okay. I, I could probably research that for you and I'll let you know. Um, yeah, so uh, let, let's stop here at, uh, at the end of chapter, uh, verse, uh, verse 12. And let's look into... Um, yeah, what is the situation going? What's going on in Israel? Um, the uh, <coughs> the uh, Israeli army, as you know, uh, this past week began pumping salt water from the Mediterranean Ocean into the tunnels uh, at uh, a phenomenal rate, something like six thousand cubes uh, cubic feet per hour. That is a phenomenal amount of water. Think about what 6,000 feet this way, this way, and that way is. It's a lot of water. And uh, that has resulted in, instead of like, you know, before they were in hand to hand combat, they would capture maybe 10 or 12 terrorists uh, a day. What has happened once it started flooding the tunnels was literally when you flood a tunnel, what happened to the rats? Yeah. Or they come out. Yeah. <laughs> they come out through the, the, the shafts well, with their hands up and uh, they have gone to a situation where hundreds of terrorists are surrendering every day because your option is to stay in the tunnel and drown or, you know, since you're not sure if those 70 virgins are going to be really virgins, um, you know, get out of the tunnel. Um, so they, they are capturing literally, I think uh, as of yesterday, the count of people that have been captured as a result of the flooding of the tunnels. They, flushed over, out. They, they were flushed out. Yeah, it's over a thousand terrorists that have been captured. And you can see the difference in the numbers. Like before, they, were, they didn't even bother to show you a video of the 10 or 12 that captured each day. When you look at the video from the last few days, they about, the, the terrorists are lined up in their underwear. They always do that, huh? Yeah, there's a reason for that. These people can have bombs on them. Ah. So you, uh, they, they strip you down, uh, and, and actually, um, they, uh, they, they don't show you that part, but they actually strip them totally naked so they can make sure there's nothing there. And then they, uh, they handcuff them behind their backs and uh, have them sit down. So there's, or, there's like four in a row, there are 14, and it goes on block after city block after city block after city. Think about how many people that is. That's a lot of people. So, in that sense, they're, they're, they're making some progress. Uh, 
Caroline Glick in her um, in her article. Uh, you you know who she I is. I just watched her. She interviewed the person that prepared the bodies for the dead. Yes. The woman. Yeah. I just watched that yesterday. Yeah. Um, she is. Uh, she's an American. She has a lot of contacts inside Washington. I'm not quite sure what she did for a living before she started her own blog. Uh, but she. Uh, and for my assessment of her, she appears to be either a conservative or an orthodox Jew. Um, I, I, uh, she's definitely not a liberal or a reformed Jew, I, I can tell you that. Um, she basically uh, outlined the situation very, very clearly. And I, I'd, I'd like you to consider what she said. She's very accurate. She said her sources inside the State Department tell her that not his last trip, but his second to last trip to Israel, Anthony Blinken, who is really um, a disciple of Barack Obama, in case you're not aware of who he is. He, uh, this is really the third presidency of, of, of Barack Obama. It's Obama 3.0. Because uh, the, everybody that has immediate access to Joe Biden was handpicked by Obama and were members of Obama's inner circle. Obama still remains the only president of the United States who did not leave Washington, D.C. after his term was finished. So I think you see what's going on here. Um, Anthony Blinken sat down with Netanyahu and told him very bluntly, in no uncertain terms, he said, President Biden will not get reelected because he's in deep political trouble. And he said, Obama wants Biden to be the next president. He doesn't want anybody else because it's easy to control him. He says, and we need your help. He said, we are in danger of losing the Palestinian vote, you know, the Muslim vote in America, because they're, they're saying they're not gonna vote unless we get a ceasefire. We've got to have a ceasefire, period. And he basically threatened uh, Netanyahu with cutting off arms shipments. So uh, on the surface, in front of the news cameras, uh, everybody is. Right. But behind the scenes, you need to see what's in his hand behind the back. Uh, and so uh, right now, there is a problem in that uh, Netanyahu was forced to accept that four day uh, siege. The second problem is that Netanyahu, not to put all the blame on Biden, uh, Netanyahu had uh, pressure from within. Uh, all of the people who, who, all of the areas that were hit by the terrorists on October 7th and all of the people who were killed were far left-wing liberals. The area that they came from, all those people there, both very, very liberal. Many of them are atheists. And the opposition, which is joined with uh, Netanyahu in a unified government, 100% of, uh, of, of the votes are, are now on Netanyahu's side. They want to get any abductees back. It would be like, you know, if somebody captured New York, Chicago, New Orleans, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Seattle, uh, the Democratic Party is not going to say, oh, let's try and get it wrong. <laughs> no, I don't think so. They would want to get those people free and get them to the voting booth. And so um, the opposition basically is saying, look, you know, people are demanding that we get some of the abductees back. Then the Yahoo's original position was, I am going to, uh, to have to make some hard choices here. And sometimes, when you're faced with a choice between a few, uh, uh, 250 people and a nation, a leader has limited options here. As a leader, you cannot put 250 people ahead of 6 million. So he basically said, some of the abductees may die. Uh, when uh, Lincoln put the squeeze, uh, Give us a ceasefire and we'll get you some of the abductees back. The opposition said, we 
we want some of the abductees back. So that is really what's going on. As I've said to you before, men should never see how their sausages or their politics is made. It'll, be, it'll make your stomach turn. That's exactly what's happening. I suggest we continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And the peace of yeah. Jerusalem is not a tree. It's a person. That he would come soon. Yes, Don? I just heard this morning on the radio that the University of Pennsylvania president resigned. She should. Okay. I don't know why all three of them have. All three of them have? No, oh. I think I don't think all three of them should. Chairman. Well, she's yeah. the one that said. Oh, I didn't know that one. Oh, that, 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 yeah. These people, you know, they don't understand. As I said to you before, the Jews exist for a season and for a reason to the known to God. One of them was, of course, they were to be a light to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, you see these people prospering and your people are not. You say, well, maybe their God is something about their God. So they were to be a light. But they were also to be a standard by which God will judge the nations. The Bible tells us repeatedly that God will judge the nations on the basis of how they treated his children. And you have to look at it, as I said to you before, if you lived um, next door to Mike Tyson, and you hated this guy, I mean, after all, he's rude, he's crude, he's uneducated, he's, you know, okay? You, you are not going to tackle uh, Mike Tyson yourself, not unless you have a friend who's a plastic surgeon that can fix you after. You know, you hate Mike Tyson, but you can't touch him. So you see his kid walking down the street, skippity doo da, skippity doo da, and you say, "Well, I can't beat up on Mike Tyson, but I can't get the kid." That's exactly what they say. Oh, we have that much. <laughs> Okay, uh, but uh, you know, that is the problem with people who are anti-Semitic. Yes, they hate Jews, but that's not their real target. Their real target is God, and their problem is their arm is too short to box with God. Your arms can't reach up to heaven. So you know you can't punch God in the nose, so what do you do? You look for his kid going home from school, skippity doo da, and you punch the kid in the nose. That's the fundamental basis of anti Semitism. Yes, they hate you, but they hate them because God has chosen them. Because they don't want to follow God's law. And yes, that is basically, they, they don't want a God in their life. They don't want God. They want a life, he said. I want to do whatever I want to do to whoever I want to do it, whenever I want to do it, however I want to do it, as often as I want to do it, and wherever I want to do it. That is the fundamental problem. Let's, uh, let's close in, in prayer. And, um, uh, uh, thank you for your patience with me. I'll talk, I, I will be here next week, and then I, I have to tell you, of course, after that, I've gone for Christmas to my sons, because family responsibilities and duties. My, and my sons really do enjoy it. So, um, and then when I, uh, I'll, I will be back in time for the first Sunday in, in January. Uh, we will, uh, we will have, uh, uh, we should wrap this up very shortly. Uh, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on uh, the Holy Spirit, um, uh, Jennifer notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I wanted to get on to Revelation. Uh, so, so let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Good morning, Father, and thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your incredible love for us, Lord, because you, as our King, you didn't send us to die in battle for you. You came to die for us. No king has ever done that. We thank you, Lord, because you have given us the assurance that you have conquered death. You resurrected yourself from the dead. No king can do that. No God can do that. 
so-called gods can do that. Only the living God of Israel can do that. Help us, Lord, to take the incredibly beautiful message of your gospel to a dark, dying world. We live in extremely dark times where people really hate God and don't want to have anything to do with Him. So they attack His people because they can't attack you. Help us, Lord, to reach out to them with love, with truth, that they may want to know more about this God that we serve with such joy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can I read a little book? Yes. Uh -huh. Just uh, a few in particular, but I thought maybe they would might be interested in uh -huh. the idea. Okay, since everybody's so interested in going, getting on to Revelation, yes. why don't we skip the Holy Spirit and put that after Oh, okay. Um, That's just a my little proposal. Oh, okay. Uh, we can do that. Yeah, uh, we can do that. Thank you for being here. All right. Good. Okay. Bye. Nice to you back. Bye. 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 Yes. Marianta.